Hello and welcome to the Geeky Sci-Fi Podcast, the official podcast of the Geeky Sci-Fi Group on Facebook. And today we've got a very special episode. We're joined by two authors of a book that's become a bit of a phenomena. phenomena. Uh, Scarred for Life, Volume 1, The 70s, Growing Up on the Dark Side of the Decade. And I'm joined by uh, Stephen Brother... Sorry, I always get your names to it. Like Stephen Brotherstone and Dave Lawrence. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. fine. So, uh, if you could just introduce us to the book and how it came about. Well, uh, God, when was it, Dave? Was it like seven years ago now? Or something? 19, like, like, sorry, uh, yeah, <laughs> 1906. It was uh, 2014, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, um, it was basically a conversation in work that we had. Dave's been a, well, I got most, a longer serving customer, haven't you? 25 thank you. years now. Thank you for not saying oldest. <laughs> I, I always say that, yeah. <laughs> but basically we're having one of those conversations where it's always like, oh, do you remember that comic? Do you remember that TV show? Oh, remember that kid's TV show? Remember that kid's serial? Remember that sitcom? And it was like an hour and a half, wasn't it? In between mm. serving and doing jobs. We realised at the end of it that every single thing we talked about, without exception, was either violent, racist, sexist, terrifying, horribly inappropriate. And like 70% of it was geared towards children. And I think Pervis just wanted to read more about it, didn't we? So yeah. we were looking for books on Amazon everywhere, figuring someone must have written a book about this. There's millions of growing up in the 70s books. And there wasn't a single one. So one of my mates in work said, well, you like writing? Why don't you write it? You and Dave? And it was kind of grew from there. I remember we, we started yeah. making notes. And I think I think also there were, there were books, as as Steve said, there were loads of books available, but none of them were kind of exactly the tone that we wanted. The, 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 a lot of the books were kind of. Do you remember this? Yeah, yeah, we do. We do remember that, but that that was kind of the level of it. Whereas we wanted to kind of go into, yeah, it is sexist and racist and so forth. But why is it that? You know, why was it the way it was? I think that's what we wanted yeah. as well. Well, I think that's one of, um, one of the great things about the book. You give it plenty of context. And I think at uh, the sort of turn in the millennium, there was a lot of the, this nostalgia. It was like the I Love the 80s thing on TV. And <laughs> a lot of it was like celebrities. And, and you got the impression they'd been told what to say about two minutes before they said it. You know, it wasn't people who really remembered this stuff. That, and that, that is one of the things that came out. That's one of our big bugbears, isn't it? Yeah. It was you, that kind of... Oh, it's, really it's, it's something I mentioned in the um, introduction because those clip shows, the clips are brilliant, but then it cuts to a 22 year old comedian going, wow, well that was terrible. And like, all oh, the sets are wobbling, or oh, look at the clothes. I'm like, yeah, it was made in the 70s. Some of the greatest television ever made and you're just looking at the flares. So we wanted to kind of just go, yep, yeah, the hairstyles are weird. The sets wobble, but this is brilliant, brilliant television. Or, yeah, okay, it is inappropriate, but, I mean, my, my mum and dad used to roar with laughter. Sometimes on the buses and we'd have Love Thy Neighbour on. There wasn't a racist bone in the body. It was just that, I know it's not an excuse, but that was the way things were back then. We wanted to look at why that was seen as somewhat acceptable. I don't think it was completely acceptable. There was a huge uproar over it. Love Thy Neighbour from day one. People forget about that. It was never totally acceptable. But we wanted to dig a bit deeper and unearth some obscurities as well. We, we look at Sapphire and Steel and Doctor Who and the Tomorrow People, but we unearth some real gems that even we had never heard of. So it kind of became, it started to be fair as a nostalgic book. And halfway through, I think, David, it kind of became a social history of Britain in the 70s. Yeah, I think the one thing that got me about talking about the talking heads and that kind of thing is when you look at uh, the AIDS stuff, and you had like Mike Smith demonstrating how to put on a condom and or, or explaining you couldn't you couldn't get AIDS from spit. And then a twenty-something comedian came out, oh, did they really think that? You know, yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's how it was for people. And they, I think those clip shows kind of missed that. They, they yeah. missed that context, and that's what people thought and felt. And it, 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 from a distance, from a remove, it can look silly or stupid, but it isn't. And as we've seen these days, all the things they'd say, oh, this could happen in uh, like Noah's Castle with the panic buying and stuff like that. Oh, it never happened. Yes, it does happen. And people are still the same. Yes. With the coronavirus as well. It's like, it's, it's AIDS all over again. 
oh, it's this. And then a week later, they go, oh, sorry, we were wrong about that. It's this now. So it, it, yeah. it's a learning process. We're still kind of 20 years from now, people will go, did you really think that about COVID-19? Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember at the time there was, there was like um, an LGBT helpline for AIDS. And I think it was British telecom workers had refused to work on the boxes outside in case they caught it. Wow. You know, there was all sorts of ridiculous hysteria at the time. But I mean, I was at, I was at secondary school then, and and those um, I suppose that'll be coming up in, in volume two when you when you cover the eighties. But the um, those public information films about AIDS with John Hurt doing the voiceover with the massive tombstone. I mean, Christ, put you off ever going near a girl. It did. That was one of the things we talked about in life. The seventies book is written from a perspective of a child. We were, yeah. I was kind of like I was born in nineteen seventy, so I was ten in nineteen eighty. I was a child back then. So, like you say, Dave, the things that scared us weren't real. Ghosts, UFOs, the supernatural, the paranormal. Then you get to the eighties, the second book, and suddenly it's unemployment, it's rabies, it's AIDS, and yeah, I'm discovering girls, but I can't go near one. Yeah, and <laughs> it's, it's, I'm gonna leave school. Oh, am I gonna be on the dole for twenty years? It's it, it shit gets real basically. I think a lot of that though is because when you're a child, you ch your parents protect you quite a lot, don't they, from the realities that they're facing? Yes. Well, I, I'd remember like power cuts as being like an adventure. We're sitting in the dark. My dad's on a three day week. <laughs> it's exciting, but for them, it's yeah. absolutely terrifying. With myself, I was just annoyed that it happened in the middle of the Muppet show. I was, I was a bit young to understand what was happening, and I just knew that the Muppets had gone off. Um, so, so going back to the beginning then, what, what were the real things that frightened you as kids that had a massive effect? Oh, for me, I'll go for Oh, I think three big ones. The three biggest ones. Doctor Who made me an arachnophobe. Plants of the spiders. Yeah. The huge three foot long house spiders on people's backs, lifelong fear of spiders. And we talk about this in the live shows. According to me, mum and dad, I, I, was, I had no fear of spiders whatsoever up to the age of four, five. And from then on, it was just like I can't even look at one. I can't, I still can't touch a picture of a spider in a book. Um, the second one is the title sequence to series two of an ITV children's supernatural series called Shadows. Oh, Shadows, yeah, I've got Shadows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the, um, the kind of Terry Gilliam style yeah. animation title sequence. If no one's seen it, it's on YouTube. And it, I screamed the house down as a five-year-old. It's one of the eeriest things I've still seen to this day. And a little bit older. Oh, actually, this is probably the biggest scare of my entire life because Dave had to write about this in volume two. There's a rabies public information film called Rabies Means Death, which I have tried to watch for the last 30 years, and I can't. I try to, I'm actually at the end of writing about the rabies section in volume two, and I had to hand over to Dave halfway through this piece <laughs> so that he could write about this public information film. So yeah, that it's things do sky for life, things linger. Things stay with you, definitely. They definitely do. Yeah, we'll, get yeah, back to that. we'll get back to that in a sec. Uh, how about you, Dave? Uh, my, my greatest fear, as I said, was Skippy the Bush Kangaroo when I was little. Really? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the title sequence of that, and the, particularly the whistle, would make me cry every single damn time. Many years later, I had a, a kangaroo steak in a restaurant for vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like it, so I still think Skippy won. Was that, was that closure? It wasn't closure because I hated the steak. It was really perfumey. <laughs> it was just horrible. Oh. Thing. But yes, I think it's <laughs> revenge from beyond the grave, personally, I think. And I just didn't like I don't know why. Because that's, that's one of the interesting things about when people caught us after the shows and tell us what they were afraid of. It's often things you'd never think were frightening. Yeah. Yeah. It's often things like, you know, they say, I was, I was afraid of, I know, Clock or Castle or something like that. And you go, why? But it'd be something yeah. about it that to them was terrifying. One of mine my was, um, do you remember the adverts for Unigate milk with the Humphreys? Yeah. Watch out, watch out, there's a Humphrey yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. As, as a toddler, that really yeah. spooked, spooked me. And one day I was watching the TV on my own in, in, the, in the living room 
and uh, my mum and dad were having the house rewired and I wasn't really paying attention to what was going on. And this red and white wire came through the wall and I screamed the house down. I thought the Humphreys were coming for me. Wow. But there we go, you know, <laughs> it was just, you know, it was <laughs> one of those, you look at it now and it's just a harmless advert, but at the time it seemed quite sinister. Yeah, my, my other big That's fear thing uh, was a spontaneous human combustion. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That, 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 yeah. I, that I read about in The Unexplained. And I would genuinely, for about six months, lie in bed at night thinking my legs were getting warm, which is stupid because legs are the only thing that survive that thing. <laughs> that a sensible color? My, it was my belly, wasn't it? I'd lie in bed and, at night and I can feel my belly getting hotter. Mine made more sense. And also, obviously, nuclear war, because I think we all had this genuine fear that nuclear war was, was yeah. imminent. Yes. Well, that, that, was, that was my big thing. I mean, because for most people, the kind of gateway to a lot of this is Doctor Who, and, uh, you know, that was mine. And then, like most people, you become obsessed with it. Um, but then, moving on a few years, um, it was Threads. Oh, which, yeah. I, which I suppose is going to be a big part of Volume 2, Scarred for Life Volume 2. Um, yeah. And I'm a little bit obsessed with it still. I think, one, because I still have dreams about it occasionally. I think it was so nightmarish. I think it's the most nightmarish thing I've ever seen on TV. Yeah. Um, but the other, I'm quite proud that, that the BBC made that because I think it's a tremendously important film. Um, I read that the director, Mick Jackson, had, heard, had it on good authority that Ronald Reagan watched it and was quite shook up by it. Now, if that's true, you know, because after, after Threads, there was the kind of, you know, the arms reduction with Gorbachev and stuff. If that's true, it's yeah. got to be one of the most important films ever. We, we, uh, I met uh, Rhys Dinsdale, uh, had a bit of chat with him about uh, Threads. He had a... Apparently, for them, it was the most, the funniest set they'd ever been on. They never laughed yeah. so much in their entire life. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, afterwards, we had a screening for all the people in Sheffield locally who'd, who'd been extras in the background. And they said, at the end, it was just crying. Just everybody <laughs> cried. <at the> end. <laughs> but there's no because Reese, Reese's scenes were all before the bomb drops, so he could have a laugh. He didn't yeah. have to deal with the, uh, the devastation, did he? <laughs> he gets my like, oh, Also, here's an anecdote. Reese accidentally had his hair cut halfway through filming. And so he had to be filmed from one side only for about halfway through because the other side had been cut really short because he's going to play a pilot, an RAF, Second World War pilot, in his next project. So, so on what, profile only. Mm. So it's kind of, like, kind of like the Tommy Cooper sketch where he can turn around and... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, recently, myself and David, we travelled to a motorway service station just near Birmingham to meet up with um, Simon, the guy yes, who actually was with the assistant on threads. It was yeah. his, he did everything. I mean, he, the number, the anecdotes he was telling us about threads, he worked on threads, he worked on Jigsaw, he worked on Nosy Bunk, another big 80s Blimey. terror. Yeah. But it was his job to create diarrhea and vomit for threads, realistic scientifically approved like what would your vomit be like on day one of radiation poisoning so we'd have a bell jar a series of bell jars from day one to day 12 it's like wow it's kind of proper chicken soup on day one it's just bile on day 12 and oh. amazing amazing anecdotes there's a scene in threads with a huge traffic jam in the middle of sheffield city oh. center and it was almost guerrilla filmmaking they didn't seek approval from the council simon went out in a car and stopped at a junction to create a traffic jam, and someone wound up was on a walkie-talkie, basically going, "No, you're safe. The police are miles away. They're coming. They're coming. Drive, drive." <laughs> <laughs> so it was just, it was just, he was also the I guy think, think. who was in the uh, in the car with Reese during a, a, a love scene when Reese and his girlfriend were in the car, and he was on the floor of the car with a kettle, a boiling kettle, to get the windows to steam up. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant! <laughs> See, I love stuff like this. I could listen to stuff like this all day, and well, he. It just really intrigues me. I mean, I spoke to Reese Dinsdale a few times on Twitter. Um, mm. He's really, really friendly. But I first got sort of wind that, that it was quite a happy production when uh, someone had told me they'd seen David Briley, um, who Doctor Who fans will remember, he was K-9 for a season. And he played one of the, the parents in Threads. And he said it was such a laugh. 
And when, and when you watch it, you know, you, you, can't, you just can't imagine that it was. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it was even the pre Bond. Yeah, it was. Oh, sorry, yeah, go on. Sorry, go on. Uh, the the other person oh, who spoke to about it on um, on 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 um, Twitter was Edgar Wright, the director, because uh, he put it in his his top a uh, thousand films or something. So I mentioned it to him, and he said, "Yeah." He said the first the bit leading up to the bomb was kind of an influence on the first half of Shaun of the Dead. Wow. A lot of stuff goes on in the background, doesn't it? You, there's like yeah. a domestic scene going on, and on the on the TV in the background or on the radio, the situation is clearly getting worse and worse and worse. And it's just a, it's a really interesting way to do it, I think. Because no one's yeah. watching the telly; they're yeah. supposed well, to be talking to actually see the outbreak of World War Three in the background. Only the viewer, yeah. so yeah, wonderful. It's it's a fantastic production. Done yeah, by the did. science department, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yes. The BBC drama department didn't want anything to do with it, so it was thrown to the science, which is just... And it, and it was really low budget, we found out as well, it wasn't it? It, was, it wasn't a high budget production at all. Yeah. Because the BBC no, didn't have a chance of winning any awards, just, got, just, just make it, don't, we're not going to really support this in, you know. What, yeah. I, I remember, thinking, you know, I lived in, in, in the sort of household where we talk about stuff that was happening on the news and you'd had the miners strike and unemployment and Thatcher at the time. I mean, mum said, oh, I think you should watch this. It's about nuclear war. And I was 11. And <laughs> that, that was quite heavy going. You know, I remember lying in bed in cold sweat afterwards, convinced that we were going to die. And not long after, I started secondary school. And in the afternoon, we had a, it was Friday afternoon, and we had art class. And all of a sudden, the four-minute warning went off. And <laughs> you, could see, <laughs> you could see the colour drown out your mate's faces. And the teacher came and she goes, oh, don't worry, it's just the, it's just the factory next door clocking off. He's oh, thank God for that. I, I live was... up the road from uh, Unilever, and at 8.45 every morning, they would sound an air raid siren type sound to, uh, to warn the workers that the working day was about to start. So I faced nuclear annihilation at 8.45 every single morning. <laughs> well, you know, that, <laughs> I suppose you would touch on these... All on the next week, you have things like when the wind blows yeah. and yes. the day after yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Frankie goes to Hollywood. Yeah. I mean, you even cover pop music, don't you? Yeah, yeah. We've got our top 10 nuclear war pop songs. The Cold War, the nuclear terror, I'd say, Dave, it's probably the, the last entire third of yes. the second part of book two. It's too yeah. big to, to yeah. be contained. So, yeah, two, we cover two sections. Yeah. We've got board Sorry. games, we've got um, yeah. comics, books. Every, the, the Cold War touched on every single corner of pop culture in the 80s. So, yeah, we leave no stone unturned with that one. Yeah. It's a whole genre in itself, isn't it? You know, all the, all the nuclear yeah. paranoia stuff and that. Yeah. Could I ask you about the live shows? How have your live shows been going? Very oh, well. well. It's, it's a good laugh. We have a really good time. I don't I think people who watch it do too. Yeah, I think they're fantastic. It's... Um, it's a learning experience because it started with uh, well Bob Fisher, um, Radio T's BBC presenter, who's basically we, we went on his show to promote the book. Uh, we got on like a house on fire. He, he's massively into this stuff anyway. He does a, a monthly column in 14 Times called The Haunted Generation. So this is his kind of specialist subject. And he invited us back for a sort of live chat, informal live chat at a, a little vegetarian restaurant in Teesside and it kind of grew from there we just kind of thought should we do this kind of yeah. properly and it kind of it's grown from us in front of like 50 or 60 people to a full audio thing a, a big slideshow we've found it into it's, it's a comedy show because we don't want to terrify people it's quite dark material but you can come along and have a real laugh basically but yeah um, it's, it's, so we've got we've gone from like this uh, an audience of like we started off in um, Downham Market in Norfolk with 30 people in the audience, didn't we? For one yeah. thing. We drove five hours to get there. We talked <laughs> for half an hour, drove five hours back. That was our first thing. And then I said, Bob, Bob Fisher got involved. We're now, we're now we're in theatres. We're actually curtains and behind stage. And, and it's, uh, it's grown quite a lot. Amazing. It's wonderful to meet people and talk to people. And we, yeah. after the show, we have a 20-minute or so question and answer session, which is us asking the audience rather than I'm asking us. We want to collect your fears. We want to collect your stories. It's 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 fascinating for us. 
Absolutely. Again, Leeds, a guy came up and said, this robot frightened me and I've never heard of this robot before in my life. We looked it up and it's, it's just really interesting. You, you find out things you never knew. Yeah. And of course, yeah. a, a big part of it as well, and in the 70s, but is the, uh, the public information films from the 70s. Now, some of those, they were really quite horrific. And I remember they would be on kind of like in the commercial break of Tiz Was. Yeah. Yeah. And you would have that. Like... <laughs> you know, you know. Yeah, Oh, go, sorry, go <laughs> Sorry for listeners. The way this works is like you're about to say something and there's a bit of a delay and it cuts the other person off. So it's a little bit awkward, but we're trying to sort of bear with it. Uh, sorry, Stephen, you were saying? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a huge chunk of both books in the middle, right at the end of the television section. Because again, we, we didn't want to skim over and just do the top five. We've unearthed some real kind of obscure gems there as well, ones that weren't as well known as the, the big ones. Everyone remembers, um, and rightly, the spirit of lonely water, Donald Pleasance, as the hooded monk that was watching children drown in, um, in ponds and lakes, which came in 1973, and it changed the entire game. Up to that point, public information films were, quite, were informational, and they'd tell you about decimal currency, and what to do when you go on holiday, or it would warn you in a quite a gentle way. But that was, a minute long horror film it's, it's just a beautifully made horror film just a, in kind of i think it's a minute and 10 seconds and that just changed the game it just becomes horrific no holds barred anything goes after that and like you say it'd be in the middle of tiswas or magpie without any warning you'd have the the famous broken glass public information oh, film. that's the horrible that one. <laughs> oh for anyone who's listening you, you didn't see <laughs> David's face then just scrunched <laughs> up like a ball. But it's the end of the freeze frame, like inches away from a, a, a shard of kind of broken lemonade bottle on a beach. It's horrific. But yeah, it's, that was another thing. It was, these were things that we carried with us in everyday life. Even if we didn't quite get the message, we knew the image. We knew not to go kind of near, well, near farms. You've got Apaches where the kid drowns in slurry. And a little girl drinks bleach or whatever it is and dies horribly. But yeah, that was a, a huge, huge part of our lives back then. That kind of bombardment of warnings. What well, everything will kill you. Everything was gonna kill you in the house, in the street, in parks, you go on holiday. So it was quite a scary time. I think the Apaches were in schools, wasn't it? So you couldn't even get away from it if you went to school. You'd be you'd be horrified in school as well. He'd sit you down in front of a TV on, on a sort of Meccano <laughs> set-up trolley. They'd wheel in and then you'd, the, you'd open the doors of the TV and, and they'd show you something absolutely horrific. It's no wonder, really, we've got a generation of adults on anxiety medication, is it, really, when you think <laughs> of all this? Um, but that's the, the, the weird thing about reading, reading Scar for Life is that when you were a kid, you thought this was only affecting yourself. Um, and then you realise that, you know, everyone up and down the country was having the same nightmares and the, the same fears, you know. One person, one person out of the shows came up to me and said, it's as if you were writing my brain. Yes. <laughs> Which is a very weird thing to say, but I understood what he meant. You know, that we, we, like I say, it taps into this communal experience that we all had, that we weren't aware that everybody else was having at the same time. And obviously some of the big hits is like, you feel, well, clearly everybody was afraid of that. But to be afraid of, I don't know, Mr. Soft and the... That advert is just a very specific thing. But people are afraid of that. And you find, you know, it's like a support group, really. And it's, it's, definitely, it's very difficult call it like to um, get across to young people now. Um, how, how scary that was in the context of the time. Because nowadays they've got access to horror films on Netflix. They've got the internet. You know, there's bloody beheadings on the internet, real beheadings and things like that. Uh, all sorts of horrors, but at the time, you know, something like Sapphire and Steel just uh, it blew your mind because it was so ambiguous and so weird for, for a kid's sort of tea time slot. I think the thing as well is that there's no there's no community of viewing nowadays. Everything's so splintered, and people are in their own little worlds on the internet, watching their own little thing. Whereas I think when we were, we were watching all these things, we'd go into school the next day and then we'd talk about them and they'd become mythologised in that way. Yeah. 
That was the thing, you had three channels back then, so you had a one in three chance that everyone else was watching what you were watching. Sapphire and Steel, David, that was the thing. It was it was on in the kind of give us a clue, name that tune slot, seven o'clock, yeah. half seven in the evening. One of the most surreal, languid, bizarre, eerie TV shows ever made. And they were kind of like, yeah, this is the quiz show slot. Incredibly cerebral as well. I don't think there's ever been anything quite like it before or since. And you would watch it while waiting for, I don't know, Kenny Everett to come on. And there's two people who may or may not be elements or something, because they're not elements, so I find still are elements. But taking the time, going around a railway station or a, someone's house, and there's a guy like him, a Greek painting with no face and a bowl of hat. For some reason, it's, it was a strange time to be alive. And then, like you say, you go into school the next day and everyone's going, did you see it? Did you know what was going on? That was terrifying. So there's a bit where Joanna Lumley turns around to the camera and you'd get crash zooms, which you don't get anymore, but the camera would suddenly in a split second zoom in on someone's face and her face looks like mincemeat yeah. in one of the episodes. And it it's pretty horrific. Absolutely. Yeah. Another yeah. one uh, that got me like that as a kid with, with like the Doctor Who used to be genius at doing those and the, the City of Death where... Um, Julian Glover takes his mask off and you see Spaghetti Head with the one eye there. As a kid, that was terrifying. How does he fit that head into that mask? It's the same. 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 It's the when they take the human skin yeah. off, their head's about three times bigger. <laughs> <laughs> See, V, that was, that was a real sort of uh, event television at the time, wasn't it, V? Um, yeah. That was, that was the kind of Game of Thrones or Walking Dead of its day. Everyone was talking about that in the playground. Because ITV didn't watch the Olympics, did it? It wasn't the same time as the Olympics. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. sort of counter program as the Olympics, so you just watch that instead. Proper communal viewing. Everyone yeah. knew V. Everyone knew about the yeah. lizard baby, the bear, the, oh, the, the rat eating. Amazing. <laughs> and it, it's the same as like when you had Jaws on or a, a big ITV premiere, the streets were empty because you only had the three channels. You were all watching the same thing. And it's kind of a shame in a way that we've lost that. Yeah. Like I say, nowadays with the internet, you, I mean, this, the whole experience is different now. What, when I was little, I didn't know when books would come out or when films were coming out. So it'd be a surprise, a genuine, a genuinely exciting surprise when I saw a new Target novel, for example, on the wire rack in the local news agents. But, and you've lost that. You've, you've lost something about the, the lack of, with, with too much knowledge comes, you lose something, I think. And I say, yeah. as I say, when you yeah. mythologize things, when you go to school and somebody says, do you remember when his head fell off? And you go, I do now. That never happened. Because you couldn't go home. Yeah. No, you couldn't, you couldn't, you check, couldn't go home and watch it on video. Watch it, you couldn't freeze frame. You couldn't watch the DVD. My worst memory ever is of Harrison Chase in the Seeds of Doom. Oh, yeah. Falling on Boston Machine. And the crack, you know, the cracking of the bones and the blood sprayed everywhere. None of that happens. You see none of that. It's in my mind. That was in my mind that that happened. It never it's, happened in reality. It's like that scene in uh, Reservoir Dogs where uh, the guy gets his ear chopped off. Now, if you watch the scene there, the camera pans to the left and you don't see him get his ear chopped off. But what you imagine in your head is worse than it would have been if they'd have used like a rubber ear or, or whatever. Just hearing the screams and yes, yeah. that's almost what you'd do if you were stood there. You would turn your head away from it. I just thought that was so effective. Yeah. There was a scene last, I saw on the end of the week, it was actually from um, uh, I Claudius where they pull a woman's head back and about to chop her head off. And she goes, not my head. And then they do a, a, a shot where it just pans really quickly across as if it's a head flying across the room. Of course, you don't see it. <laughs> it's a very effective way of doing it. When I was, when I was about seven. seven. Sorry. Sorry, oh, sorry Stephen. Said, I remember at the time with Reservoir Dogs, because it caused such a stink, there were people who were utterly convinced that everyone else was wrong. And no, I remember seeing the ear come off. I watched the guy <laughs> cut the ear off. But it was the, it's a Mandela effect thing. They were yeah, utterly yeah. convinced that they'd seen the guy chop through the ear. It's, it's absolutely bizarre because it was so effective. And again, it's that thing of 
I think back then you kind of had to concentrate a bit more because you were thinking, I don't know if this is ever going to be repeated again. No such thing as video recorders. So this is my one and only chance to watch this. So I think I used to really kind of stare at the screen and soak it all in. And sometimes I'd draw what I'd just seen afterwards. I was a bit of an artist as well. But yeah, I think now people are kind of one eye on the screen, one eye on another screen, your phone, because you're kind of texting your mate or whatever. But yeah, something's been lost, definitely. Did you ever do that thing, you know, pre-video where you'd have the audio cassette recorder next to the TV? And... I yes. did. Yeah. Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. My, my, my favourite Doctor Who is Robots of Death because I recorded that on this little bush oh, tape. Oh, amazing. Recorder. Yeah. And so I'm so familiar with that. Just the sound of the doors is so nostalgic to me because obviously I'd listen to it over and over and over again. So just that whole sound of boop, 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 when they open the doors, that's it's so nostalgic. I... Wow. I had a friend who was a little bit older when I was a kid. For those people who are listening, you probably know him, um, Steve Costello, in Offerton, in Stockport. And I used to hang around with him, and he, he was a bit older than me, so he remembered the Doctor Who stories that I, that I uh, never saw because I was too young. But he would recount them, and he'd had his own bits in. But that then becomes sort of canon in your head. Mm. And then he, would, he had this book of, a, like a photo novel of Alien, um, oh yeah, yeah. Just reading this as a kid, it just seemed so horrific. But in my head, it was ten times worse than it actually turned out to be. You know, just because you'd seen these photographs. Well, I had the graphic novel of Alien when he was a kid, yeah. and my, my dad bought it. Me. I talk about this in Volume One as a huge horror fan from a very early age, and quite a squeamish one. The holy grail of films that I wanted to see was Alien. As a nine-year-old, obviously it was an X, an, an 18 at the time. So all my knowledge of Alien came from the newspapers, saying it was kind of like an alien, a thing bursts out of John Hurt's chest, which sounded like the most disgusting thing ever at the time. And I remember the graphic novel version of the, the Alien movie came out. And my dad bought it me from W. H. Smith. Now, the problem was, I didn't see Alien for about another four years, I think it was. I might be wrong, it might be 1981, 1983. But for those two years, I had to rely on the graphic novel, which was 10 times worse than anything in the film. The chest burst there is an eruption of blood that splatters the entire room. <laughs> so that's what I was waiting for. I knew it was gonna happen when I finally was allowed to stay up and watch it. And when it came to that dinner scene, I remember telling my mum, that I felt a bit ill and ran out the room because <laughs> I didn't want to see that huge shower of blood. So when I did see it finally a few years later, I just went, oh, was that it? And it's still a disgusting scene, but not what was it. Again, you had to rely on other media. Yeah, yeah. To, to kind of carry you through photo novels, comics, book adaptations. Oh, the novelizations were amazing because they'd add in the deleted scenes that were in the original script. But yeah, it was, you, you kind of, you didn't have your special features on your DVDs back then, so. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing time. So we've already uh, spoken a bit about the um, the second book, Volume 2, uh, and we discussed the Cold War uh, paranoia stuff that's in there. Also in the 80s, we had uh, the, the video nasty era, and I believe you cover that as well. Yeah, it's a big, definitely. It's a, that was a huge thing for me. I think more than Dave, again, I grew up as a massive horror fan. And in the 1980s, I, mean, I still haven't seen Top Gun. I've never seen The Karate Kid. I've never seen E.T. because I was watching like Driller Killer and Texas Chainsaw Massacre when I got older there. And kind of, it's the most obscure horror films ever. I used to go through, I used to join every single video, kind of shop in the entire mile and a half radius of my mum and dad's house. And I'd go through the entire horror film section, A to Z. I'd no filter, no quality control. I'd watch everything. And I've forgotten more than I've watched. So the video nasty era was huge for me. It's kind of split into two sections for me. We didn't get a video till 1986, which is insanely late for someone in the 1980s. So I had to rely on my mates. I'd kind of go around to my mates' houses when the parents were out, or we'd dive upstairs and watch like The Thing or in seminoid or something and then when we did get our video that's when oh god the, the floodgates opened when i was 16 i was kind of 
I kind of found like a mate who could get hold of any video nasty, literally. So it was like The Exorcist and Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Cannibal Holocaust, which I kind of watched through my fingers. But it was a, yeah, it was a huge, huge one for me. There was that period towards the beginning before the, the ban where the local news agents, the off license, everywhere would have a spinner rack full of videos and they often didn't know what they were buying in. And I'll, I'll say this in the live shows, I'll never forget about it, forget this image as long as I live. The news agents over the road from my mum and dad's street, they had Night of the Living Dead, The Exterminator and Cannibal Ferox next to a slush puppy machine. <laughs> <laughs> that he was blathering, drooling over these horrendous video covers that they couldn't get out as a what a thirteen year old, <laughs> insane. But Dave, you had a video butcher. Yes, yeah. Near to me, there was a, a video, video butcher. butcher. A video butcher. One half was a butcher's shop, and the other half was a wall of videotapes and those really big chunky, chunky boxes. So you could you could go in, you could get a leg of lamb, and you know, I say Cannibal Holocaust or whatever. So, you know, <laughs> that's your whole evening sort, isn't it? It sounds like something from the League of Gentlemen. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's everywhere just thought there was money to be made here. So everywhere had these little racks of videos. And that's the, again, as Steve says, totally inappropriate content. I, re- I remember even before um, we had a video recorder, I used to go, when my mum nipped in the post office, I used to nip in the video shop just to look at the covers. Mm. You know, and this is like a whole new world because it was far more graphic than anything that had been shown on television. Um, yeah. What was the one, what was the one that showed a woman on the front? She was in the shower and there was like slugs coming out of the shower. I always remember that one. Oh, that oh. might actually it could have been slugs. They did actually make a film with Sean Hudson's slugs, but there was one called oh, it was it Slither. Oh, I Slither. Yeah, yeah. Film. Yeah, That's quite a recent-ish one, though, isn't it? I was thinking 80s. Yeah, yeah. yeah my mind's gone blank. There's a David Cronenberg film with these little yeah. kind of... They look like Ted. <laughs> these little shit-like kind of things that came out of the bath. But now I remember that cover myself, yeah. But that was the thing. The covers were often better than the film. But one of my yeah. biggest things about video nasties was the glamour and the hysteria and the fear that grew up around them. And as a teenager, or someone in my early 20s, when I did track loads of them down, I found that most of them were awful, just awful films. And you kind of come away going, oh, God, that was just horribly disappointing. But sociologically, again, it was parents were whipped into a frenzy by the, the fear of these films. And often some of the, um, the gore that was talked about was one or two scenes that had lasted a split second sometimes. I mean, so don't get me wrong, some of them were absolutely revolting. <laughs> but a lot of them were just bad films. They kind of got scooped up in the entire wide net that the police and the government had laid out kind of thing. So well, some films that shouldn't even have been there, I don't think. It was a, it was a weird time. I, I remember that time. list. There was a list, wasn't there? That were, um, was it 80? 80 films that were on the list? Yeah, something like that, yeah. There, were and two you, lists there. there wasn't like an A list and a B list, the worst ones and then the less worst <laughs> ones. Yeah. There's ones that were outright banned and ones that were... I don't think it was. It was, there was a banned list and a kind of... I think I've read about it, written about it already. The ones that were kind of on the danger list, that kind of thing. But that's the weird thing. A lot of them were never banned. It's a strange thing. They were kind of... Distributors and shops were just terrified of getting calls from the police, so they just didn't stop them. They were, yeah, they were just kind of yanked from the shelves. I'll never forget the tried to cause the controversy. Of... Oh, sorry then. So, one company tried to cause controversy by sending their video to Mary Whitehouse, didn't they? It sparked the entire. That was the company that yeah. sparked the entire video nasty yeah. hysteria. When that kind of video horror film, they were all unrated pretty much back then, mm-hmm. so anyone could go in and get them. And um, the distributor that had Cannibal Holocaust tried to drive up sales of Cannibal Holocaust by sending a copy to Mary Whitehouse thinking, there's no such thing as bad publicity, but it turns out there is such a thing as bad publicity. And that sparked the entire video nasty ban that lasted for, for years. I mean, even into the 90s, you still didn't get a copy of The Exorcist, which was freely available throughout most of the world. So it was, yeah, backfired on them massively. <laughs> 
It was bizarre. I remember that one of the films that you could get arrested for for owning was The Evil Dead. Mm. That was one of the big ones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The tree scene is the worst, I think. The what, sorry? Yeah. yeah the, the scene with the tree is... Yeah, is yeah, yeah. 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 You don't watch that now, though, and it's like a cartoon. It's just like a kind yeah. of bloody Warner Brothers cartoon. But that was seen as that was the one of the ultimate video nasties back then. It was like a badge of honour if you saw the, war, the the Evil Dead. We had a guy who lived next door to us who used to have um, a pirate video uh, shot running from his garage. And he had fo- photocopied covers. And once the title sort of lost popularity, he'd record over it with something else. So then, if you watched the film and left it running, you would often get the film on underneath it that had been on previously that could have been something totally inappropriate. He got busted eventually. But you couldn't get off our road on a Friday or Saturday night because there'd be queues of cars waiting to come in and have a have a look through his uh, sunblast boxes in the in the garage full of films, you know. That was it. Everyone had a trailer for Video Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We never had a Video Man by us because we had about 25 video shops in a two-mile radius, but... Everyone I know, all my mates were like, oh no, the video man came around like a bizarre Mr. Whippy and kind of pulled up outside your house, opened the back doors and there was like family films, there was the horror films, maybe a video nasty under the counter and as they always say, uh, kind of something for the dads as well. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Mr. Whippy yeah, and Shane. What the thing about what you said about getting taped over, I'll never forget the day, the, the video city around the corner from my mum and dad's house. They were at the caravan. We had a caravan in Wales that we rented every summer. They'd gone away for the weekend and left me to look after the house. So I was like, right, what are films? Went round to rent a couple out. And they had the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This was like 1987, when it was at the height of the kind of the, the video nasty boom. Massively banned, massively inappropriate. Someone had put it out by accident. So I kind of took it to the counter, shaken like a leaf. And thought they were going to go snatch it out of my hand and say, oh, no, 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 sorry, that's a mistake. But the girl there was just kind of chatting to her mate, put it through. I ran home, drew the curtains, watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre for the first time on like a 10th generation copy, which was like watching it through a snowstorm. And it terrified me. It genuinely unnerved me. But as the end credits started, there was a kind of white noise happened. And the rules... Um, Eric Idle and Neil Ennis's <laughs> rules. Someone had taken over that they whatever had been on before the rules with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So I had an amazing double bill that night. <laughs> it was total whiplash, but yeah, it was great. Awesome, awesome. Uh, it's such a strange era now when you when you look back and everything you know everything's so freely available now and you know you can get anything now, can't you? I mean. You, Torrenting yeah. or Netflix or, or whatever. I think kids today don't really understand this because, like, I, I say I teach kids, and one time they, this one lad recommended a, a Mexican drug cartel execution video to me <laughs> as a bit of a laugh. Uh, it wasn't. It was absolutely horrible. But you know, it's not the same thing. I think a lot of things we were scared of were more psychological. I think. Yeah, yeah. And it wormed into your brain rather than actually being viscerally disturbing. Yeah, it's kind of a a weird situation now because I think about um, a lot of the stuff that my nephew watches is more sort of along the lines of, I mean, he's 10, so everything he sees is kind of like Pixar films or Marvel, that kind of thing. And daytime TV is kind of sanitised a bit now. I mean, thinking back to when I was a kid, um, you'd be sat there after Rainbow and Armchair Thriller would come on. Yeah. And I just remember those opening titles. And you think about it, it was so inappropriate in a way. Well, a lot of those uh, Space 1999, the really horrible ones with the, the gruesome corpses, they were on like 11 o'clock in the morning. It's not like 11 o'clock, you have like some desiccated corpse. Or well, my favourite one is uh, Wait Till Your Father Gets Home, which is not a kid's cartoon. And they showed that 11 o'clock in the morning because, you know, kids' cartoons, there you go. So, you, so you've got the, you know, the, the, the dodgy opening titles. You've got them going around pulling theatres in one episode. So, yeah, there, there was no, there was no uh, watershed for kids in those days. 
wait, wait for your for, sorry, wait till your father gets home. I always think of as kind of like a forerunner to the um, the Simpsons and Family Guy and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's yeah, it wasn't yeah. a children's cartoon. It was written by two uh, adult uh, comedy writers, a, a guy called Harvey Bullock, not the one from Batman, and Ray Charles, not the one with the dummy, <laughs> uh, and. Um, and they 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 were they were they wrote comedies for obviously adults, and so it was a it was a, a comedy not meant for children. And if you watch the opening titles, there is clearly a date rape in the opening titles, where she goes out for a date, the daughter comes back in bruised and bedraggled. Horribly inappropriate. Dodgy, very dodgy. Very dodgy. Yeah, that's yeah. the interesting thing. I think the um, obviously now they're very aware of scheduling and what's appropriate when. And back then it seemed like they'd just take a tape off a shelf and go, we've got half an hour in the afternoon, bung that on, like you said, armchair thriller. Yeah, yeah. With, with the armchair and the kind of the shadowy figure sitting down is absolutely terrifying after nine o'clock. And they just show a repeat at three o'clock before children's television started. Well, we have this thing called the 4.45 club, don't we? Yes, yeah. That's, that's something we discovered. 4.15, you get your sooty show. 4.45, the gloves were off. <laughs> you know, you know, Children of the Stones, uh, one a uh, scarf jack. Have you ever heard of that one about the Irish Rebellion of 1798? There's, no, there's no. Cor- there's corpses uh, bleeding from the ears and the mouths. There's uh, there's Irish people put against the walls and shot by British soldiers. And this was during the, the Troubles, so this was obviously controversial TV even without all the blood and gore on the, on the screen. So the Feathered Serpent, the Feathered yeah. Serpent, yeah. Uh, Serpent, Patrick Troughton, yeah, yeah Aztec. Kind of Game of Thrones yeah. religious political saga for children, 445. Human sacrifice, beatings, stabbings, blood pouring down people's ribs. Anything went. It was really incredible. I'll tell you what was a bizarre one, the, the owl service. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah that, that's, it's, it's quite disturbing. It's, it's, it's quite a sexually charged yes. show, really. There's, yes. there's, there's one thing where the, the, the daughter in it is getting undressed and you're watching it thinking... Yeah, they're, they're gonna they're gonna pull away now. They're gonna they're gonna pull away. They're gonna cut to a different scene. Yeah, they're, they're gonna cut to a different scene now. Any second now, they're gonna and they just didn't. They just held focus as she got completely undressed. This woman, and I just think that this isn't this isn't right for a kids show. And I, I think it was Sunday evenings, early Sunday evenings, or something like that. And it was like nineteen sixty nine, going into nineteen seventy. Just a very bizarre thing. So as well as well as the two books and the live show, you've also. Um branched out into merchandise as well. Um, I bought the, the Scarred for Life t-shirt and I wore it to uh, East Midlands Comic Con last year. And uh, Nick Frost, <laughs> Nick Frost from Shaun of the Dead commented on it. And he was pointing at all the little squares on it and going, oh yeah, I remember that one, the Protect and Survive and this, that and the other. And then I went to uh, see Ingrid Oliver who played Osgood in Doctor Who and she was looking at it and you know the Alvin Stardust one the crossing the road public information one yeah. she pointed at that and she had a real sort of like weird look in her face she said is that Gary Glitter I said no <laughs> <laughs> I'm a teaching assistant I wouldn't go around wearing a, a t-shirt with Gary Glitter on it um, but you've also got the, the soundtrack album as well haven't you yes that was uh, yeah um, oh. a very talented guy, oh, uh, Kev Oyston, um, the sound the, the soul of party, and he, he got together with the musicians. Obviously, a charity very close to his heart, and he produced this brilliant, brilliant album based on the idea of scary kid shows from the seventies that didn't exist. It went, it went brilliantly well. Yeah, he wrote the Scarred for Life theme for our live yes. shows, which is incredible. But yeah, it's a group of electronica artists. The, the, the brief was to kind of, yeah, like Dave says, to create themes for Scarred for Life related mm. shows for Time Menders, which was the um, original title for Sapphire and Steel. Someone's done an, an incredible theme for that. There's one that's like a kind of Johnny Ball type BBC science show. It's not all scary stuff. It's just very um, incredible BBC 1970s schools and colleges stuff in there, but yeah, it's, it's, we were delighted with it. We were absolutely delighted with that. I think right. it's definitely something that, you know, there's a huge appetite for this sort of stuff out there and people people sort of crave all this sort of stuff. They love talking about it. 
Now, looking at your, your Twitter account, you've got just under 20,000 followers, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And I was having a look, and some of the famous people that I follow follow you, people like Mark Gatiss, Reese Shearsmith, uh, Stephen Volk, who, of course, did Ghost Watch. Um, you've got quite a few famous followers. Have you never had an offer to turn this into sort of like, I was thinking this would make a really good TV show for like Halloween or something, like a two, three hour Scarred for Life TV show. Someone needs we to offer you that. We actually have. We, we, we've come close already. And it kind of fell through, didn't it, Dave? It was, yeah. television's a weird one. It's, it's a kind of, we were in talks a couple of years ago. And these things more than likely don't get made. But, we, I mean, we've had a couple of offers recently. It's all kind yeah. of. You can approach you recently about really that, about that documentary. Um, but like I say, I mean, we're getting, we're getting quite cocky now. I think, you know, at least confidence. <laughs> we're going to start, we're going to approach people as well, saying, do you want to do this? Would you like to do this? You think, because I, I think we found, the more we've gone on, if you approach people, then they tend to be quite responsive to that. You know, I think if you just sit back and wait for things to happen, it doesn't sometimes go through. But I think we're going to, we are looking certainly to approach more people to to get involved with and this. I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's an interesting and unique perspective that nobody's really done before. No. So, and to do the antidote to the, those clip shows with the kind of 22 year old yeah. comedians, we want to treat it with as much respect on screen as we do. In the book, I mean, like we still the book's very light-hearted, and we like to throw some jokes in there. But yeah, treat it with respect, definitely. Yeah, I don't. We don't want some twenty, I say twenty, twenty-year-old talking head who's never seen any of the shows, never seen, never. Yeah, I think you've probably at least have lived through a little bit of that time to kind of get the vibe we're talking about. I don't. I don't think. Yeah. You know, so that's what I'm looking for. I think it's, it's really interesting to me to get a younger perspective. Don't get on. We're not being ageist yeah. at all. We'd love to get younger people in, children, teens, 20-somethings, and show them these things. One of our plans for book two at some point is to actually go, hopefully, back to my old school and do a little talk and show comics, books, clips, public information films to 13, 14, 15-year-olds and get their feedback. Does it have the same impact now on this generation that it did back then? I find that fascinating. But yeah, we one of the fun things I did was I actually showed some clips uh, to, I think, a 17-year-old to get her response to this particular clip. And I think her response is in the first book. And her response was, Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> the Children of the Stones. Yeah, it was the Children of the Stones. Yeah. Yeah. It was the only time <laughs> of the Stones, and that was the response I got. So that went straight in. Brilliant. So you you kind of mark the end the end of the 80s as the end of the scarred for life era is is there any mileage after that or well 1993 is the end it's um as far as we're concerned it's ghost watch the yes. um bbc halloween show which if anyone hasn't seen it it's an incredible piece of drama which was marketed kind of 50-50 as a real ghost hunt a live broadcast from one of the most haunted houses in London kind of thing, in a normal council house. I was in uni at the time, so I missed the week-long build-up, where apparently it was trailed as a drama. I mean, my mates just knew it was going to be on Halloween, Mike Smith, um, Craig Charles was in it, Michael Parkinson. As far as we were concerned, this was real. So we also missed the first 10 minutes as well, so we didn't know it was a, I think it was a Screen 1 production. So we come in 10 minutes late as this real live broadcast and the acting as far as the acting of the kind of like the the mother and the child we thought well it's just people who aren't used to being on television whereas now you look at it and think they're actors so as it went on you saw pipes the ghost lurking in the background and one of the girls in the room one of my mates was near hysterical because she saw him we didn't and she was like i saw a ghost i saw a ghost they cut to the studio because people have been ringing in seeing Mr. Pipes, and then he replay the footage. There's no ghost there. And she, I mean, I swear to God, I thought she was going to start crying because she saw a man standing by the curtains. And it got to the point where even halfway through, it's readily apparent this is a drama because obviously Michael Parkinson is possessed by a demon at the end. And as we all know, he went on to have a long and successful career <laughs> after that. <laughs> but even so, it's a brilliant, creepy piece of drama. and. We kind of had to walk the girls home to their houses where we lived. 
and my mates were kind of going to their houses one by one as I was walking back to mine and I was left on my own this 15 minute walk at kind of midnight absolutely petrified the next day a guy with learning difficulties kills himself yeah. because he thought demons were real and they were going to get him and I think that is the point when program makers realize they did have a responsibility to their audience and slowly kind of regulations and like kind of strict guidelines start coming in and I think that was the end the beginning of the end of the Scarred for Life era so we, we box off book two with that one yeah, it's an interesting point because, um, I mean, Ghost Watch, I, I, was, I must have been about 18 when that was on. I, did, I didn't buy into it at all. But I know a lot of people younger than me kind of said to me, well, that, that's our threads. Like threads was for you, that was for us, you know. Um, but it's, it's hard to imagine a threads or a Ghost Watch happening now. There's nothing really of that ilk, like you say, you know. They're probably too cautious. I mean, years and years kind of went a little bit near that. Did you see Russell T. Davies' uh, Years for Years? Years for Years? <laughs> There's a bit. Uh, um, I, was, I started watching the other day, fair enough. And I just, something else was on. And I stopped. But... <laughs> yeah, Years and Years, that's what it's called. And by the end of episode one, you think this is going the same way as Threads. But then it kind of pulls back a bit. It's still good. It's, st it's still a very good drama, but it hasn't got that same kind of shock value that, that Threads did. And you, you don't see that anymore. And I wonder if. I think about Doctor Who, talking about the, the shock thing. I was watching The Robots of Death again the other day on, on Blu ray. Um, and the robot's hand covered in blood and gore. And you'd never get that now. No. Absolutely no. never get that now. No. Me, that Mary Whitehouse was the, was the cause of it sort of being toned down, wasn't wasn't she after that? Yeah, I think it was was it uh, Deadly Assassin, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was that was you know that, that was her limit. Drowning people was her limit, I think. So. Yeah, definitely. I met um, Philip Hinchcliffe um, a couple of years ago, and um, I was asking him what he thought of the, the current the current series of Doctor Who. I said, where, how would you pitch it now, insofar as the, the level of, of, of violence? And he said, that's a good question. And he thought about it, and he said, I'd probably go as far as EastEnders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just thought, yeah, interesting, because, you know, I, I thought he did the best episodes, and if you look at it when he was removed from the show or he left to go into something else or whatever it did go a bit silly for a bit yeah i think they, they backed off too far didn't they i think that he, he'd met they'd maybe gone far as they could do with like towns of wang chiang and let's say robots of death and things like that and then they pulled back from it in you know in the next era and then i think when you got to colin baker again they went to the edge again, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. I think I think they never quite after that got the balance back of you know violence to to comedy. To, so I think they kind of teetered backwards and forwards between too much and too little. You know, so so have you any ideas what you might do after book two? Oh, we've got loads of ideas, haven't we? I think we've uh, we are, yeah. We're, we're looking at we're looking we're thinking about a, a 60s volume, a book uh, volume zero. Right. Okay. Um, we're, we're quite interested in doing a book about daytime television. You know, it was like learn to fence or origami for you. Kind of <laughs> Bump with Becca. Along with Nancy. Yeah, yeah. Bump with Becca. Fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely. Amazing. Yeah. Completely blotto woman teaching yoga to 70 year olds is brilliant. <laughs> uh, well, we During our research for Scarred for Life, we've got scans and issues of the TV Times, Radio yeah. Times. So we're looking for transmission times and details about the programs we're writing about. And, this is the thing, Dave. We're, we're looking at kind of the two o'clock in the afternoon things going, this sounds amazing. This is this bizarre thing about how to just build a shed or, like you said, origami on television or fencing or badminton. And it, we kind of want to do a book that's a lot lighter about those shows that just kind of fell down the back of the sofa. The, the telly thing, it was like never intended to be repeated, but they're so niche and strange. And Oomph with Becca, if you've never heard of it, was basically... She must have been in her 50s, 60s oh, yeah. back then. She was a kind of, this was before um, Jane Fonda's workout. She was a clearly pissed 50-something <laughs> in a tight leotard. <laughs> D 
doing kind of daytime yoga and workouts with like about eight octogenarians in a, a bland TV studio, but she's getting absolutely blotto as the episode goes on. It's amazing. I think oh. a lot of them, they made quite a lot of those people in those shows. They they would drink as they like Nancy would drink as she painted. They, everyone would drink as they cooked. So you yeah. basically get the people getting gradually more and more sozzled. It's fantastic. Yeah. They should do that on question time. What was I? I said they should do that on question time. Absolutely. You <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I've got an idea for doing a book about um, the entire history of British publication, uh, public information films from the war to 2010, when the Central Office of Information shut down, kind of tell the social history of Britain through that the decades. That's really interesting. The information that was kind of peddled to it. That was a, that's going to be a big one. Well, I'll tell you something, guys. I, as you know, I'm a big fan of the, the book, and um, I can't wait for the second one to come out. Have we got a date for that yet? <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, over for summer, but obviously things have got in the way a little bit, yes, you know, yes, yes. and so forth. Um, but hopefully, when we're, we're, we're ongoing, we're, 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 how many pages have we got now, Steve? Oh, well, we've split book two into two. This is the thing the 80s is such an enormous subject that we realized we couldn't contain it in one book, so we're doing part two, book one, which is television, and book two is going to be everything else, it's going to be games, the paranormal, um, the cold war rabies, the rest, basically. But originally, and we were on course as well, the plan was to bring part one out in June, July. Lockdown hits, and everyone I know, the, the heads have just gone a bit funny. <laughs> so it's hard to get in the headspace. So, I mean, it's going to be this year, definitely. Hopefully the awesome. autumn is now. Awesome. But yeah, we're still chipping away at it. Definitely. <laughs> Guys, I've absolutely loved talking to you. It's been fantastic. Uh, volume one still available on Lulu. Lulu.com, yeah. Yeah. Just search uh, for Lulu's so Life Volume One, you'll find it, no problem at all. Yeah, it's been an absolute success. I wish you every success with uh, part two and the live shows. I can't wait to come and see one of your live shows when everything's oh, up and running again. It's a great laugh. You should you definitely should come along and say hi as well. It's fun. Yeah. And I think you need to get onto the, some of these uh, famous followers you've got and get this TV show because I want to see this TV show. I think it'd be brilliant. All the, all the <laughs> clips and everything. Followed us the other week, didn't they? Sorry. David Williams followed us the other week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, yeah, we should do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'd love to have you on again as well. Just yeah, talking about oh, our, our normal sort of sci-fi horror stuff. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, Dave Lawrence and Stephen Brotherson. I've, I've got that the right way, right way around this time. Um, thank you so much. You've been listening to the Geeky Sci-Fi Podcast with me, David Geldard. Thanks very much. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.